So tonight, uh, about dinosaurs, why everyone wants to know what dinosaurs are and why they matter, which is why we have a, a talk just on dinosaurs, and then I'll open it up to Q&A, uh, whatever you want to ask me about creation, evolution, the Bible. Um, so first of all, just uh, to remind uh, where we're coming from, we're supposed to be giving an answer uh, to what we believe. It's a, it's a command to all Christians to give an answer uh, because the Christian faith is not a blind faith. It's an intelligent faith. We're supposed to have reasons for what we believe. And I mentioned that my, my Genesis commentary is probably the only commentary in the world that talks about dinosaurs. Not many do that. And about the age of the earth about astronomy, but it also covers a lot of the, the, the biblical texts and what it means and why it matters, how it's foundational for the Christian faith and how the rest of the Bible uh, takes Genesis as it literally. And for the sort of question, remember this book is what I, just, what I mentioned there, Creation Answers book, 60 questions and 20 chapters. And as part of this wider pack, the starter pack, which has refuting evolution for the high schools and a video about why this whole issue is important. So dinosaurs, uh, what do we say about them? We also we have uh, lots of articles on our website, creation.com, which talk about dinosaurs and how the Bible will solve a lot of the mysteries involved with dinosaurs because the Bible is the history book of the universe. And it does actually provide the information we need and, but you have to often have to understand what it's telling you. Now, first of all, let's define what I'm talking about with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are a very distinctive type of reptile. They have the legs going vertically down the body. Now, see, there are no dinosaurs living today, I don't think. There are things like the Komodo dragon, the crocodiles. Their legs sprawl out to the sides. They're a very different structure from dinosaurs. They are not dinosaurs. They should not be called dinosaurs. They're very, very different. Now, one thing about the dinosaurs, when you look at the thigh bone, they have this horizontal part there. In, in anatomy, this is called a process. Don't ask me why. This is called a process. And it lodges into a hollow spot in the in the hip bones. See, dinosaurs have a very an open uh, hole there. That's another unique feature of dinosaurs, this open um, hip bone there. It's called the acetabulum. It's a fancy word. The Latin word is means vinegar cup, but in dinosaurs there's no cup there, it's a hole. In our hip bones there's a cup there, hence it's called the acetabulum, little vinegar cup. Other animals have a cup there. Dinosaurs are unique in having a hole there. So I don't think there are any creatures like that today alive, but I think they died out far more recently than people think they did. And I'll try and explain why this is. Now, the Bible does tell you about dinosaurs. If you use a logical deduction like we're supposed to do, in John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is called the word. The Greek there is logos. Jesus is called the logos, and that's the word we get logic from. So to follow Jesus, we should be logical. We should follow the logos. So dinosaurs existed because we can tell you that God made the beasts of the earth on day six and they reproduced after their kind. Now, there's a, God front-loaded a lot of genetic variation into the kind so they could produce lots of varieties. That's different from, from, from uh, one kind evolving into another that the Bible does not allow for, but there's plenty of variation within that kind. Now, God also made humans in, on day six. Now, Genesis 2 explains a bit more about Genesis 1 because Genesis 2 is a magnifying glass uh, put on, the, on this passage of Genesis 1. And it tells you that there was one man and one woman. God made Adam from the dust. God made Eve from his rib. Okay, day Genesis 1 tells you that man was given dominion over the rest of creation. Genesis 2 has man exercising dominion by naming the animals. Naming in the Bible was an exercise of authority. So you find Genesis 2 expands a bit more on what Genesis 1 tells you. But the thing is, from these two verses, you can tell that they must have lived at the same time. That's a logical outcome of these two passages which is a shock to many people, of course, because you've been indoctrinated uh, throughout school and, and the media, Hollywood, that dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago. They've gone up from 65 to 66, it seems. 
Okay, now one pushback you could get is that if dinosaurs and humans live together, why do we not find them fossilized together? Well, when you're asked a question like that, try to go behind the assumption of that question. The assumption of that question is if things live together, then they will be fossilized together. But is this assumption correct? Well, I can prove to you it's not correct because this picture here, in the background we have a whale flipper. In the foreground we have a fish called the coelacanth, which was thought to have died out with the dinosaurs because of where we find the fossils. But in the 20th century, they found that coelacanths still are alive. So we can show you that coelacanth fossils and whale fossils are never found together, but we know for a fact that they live in the ocean together. So that's because things live together. There's no guarantee they will fossilize together because we have to understand the fossil record is not a sequence of age. It's a sequence of burial mostly by the flood of Noah's day, as I mentioned in the morning service. And it's a case of the flood would begin the fountains of the great deep. The flood began in the oceans. So I'd expect to find sea, uh, bottom dwelling sea creatures on the bottom of the fossil record because they were buried first. And then the fish because they were in the ocean, they'd be buried next. Things on the border between land and sea like amphibians buried next. That's a sort of general progression, but sometimes the flood would bury land and sea creatures together where we know they couldn't have lived together. That's happened before. We're finding fossils where land creatures, and you've got birds, land creatures, and sea, uh, sea creatures in one place because they were washed together into a basin and buried together. We know they couldn't have lived together. Okay, so that's one assumption gone down, uh, which is often the assumption they use to try to push millions of years, but it clearly doesn't work. Now, we know dinosaurs existed, no question. We find the bones. Some of them are really big creatures. Look at this. I mean, you, know, you can't even reach the knee. That's how big it is. And this creature here, Brachiosaurus, uh, this is about the height of a four or five story building. Uh, that gives you an idea. Now, a lot of dinosaurs have Greek or Latin names. This is a Greek name meaning arm lizard because its forearms are longer than the back arms. So it had a sloping back posture with a very tall neck. And this might still be the biggest dinosaur we know from a complete skeleton. Now, some creatures are bigger than dinosaurs. The blue whale is actually bigger than any known dinosaur. But certainly the largest land creatures of all time were dinosaurs. There are some uh, mammals which are, are bigger than today's mammals. You've got a very giant rhino, which is still bigger than uh, the giraffe, but not quite as big as the biggest dinosaurs. Okay, so dinosaur, this is the, one of the biggest creatures ever. Uh, here is a small dinosaur. They weren't all big. Compsognathus, the size of a, of a rooster. T-Rex was quite big. Uh, here's one of the biggest flying reptiles. Again, not, this is not a dinosaur. It's a flying reptile, but not a dinosaur. It's a different leg structure, so not, not dinosaur. Giraffe is the tallest animal today. Here's a human for comparison. So no question, big things. And big things have their own um, design features because different sizes have different requirements. You just, even though you get a lot of science fiction uh, series about scaling people up or down, it just could not work in reality because different sizes have different requirements. It just would not work. We could not be scaled up to, say, 10 times our size because we'd collapse under our own weight. We wouldn't be big, strong enough to hold our weight. And for instance, one problem with very tall creatures is trying to get the blood up to the brain against gravity. That's an issue. These are sort of 18 feet high or so. How do you get the blood up that high against gravity? Well, the answer is the giraffe has an extremely powerful heart that has a blood pressure of about 300 over 180. Now, you understand blood pressure numbers? Yeah, the, the top number is called systolic, when the pump, pl blood, uh, heart is pumping, that's a high number. The low number is when the, pl blood, the heart is relaxing. Now, humans, we should be about 120 over 80, okay? I'm sure your doctor will tell you that if you have blood pressure measurements. Okay, but the um, if a human gets over 180, we should go to the hospital. There. That's called a hypertensive emergency. We're, we're in danger of an immediate stroke at any time, that blood pressure that high. No, not good. 
uh, but the giraffe has to have a blood pressure of 300 to get the blood up to the brain. Then the problem is what happens with the, when the giraffe drinks and bends his head down? Now it's no longer against gravity. Why doesn't it have a, a huge hemorrhagic stroke because of the high blood pressure? That's been a mystery for scientists for a long time. I think a few years ago, they've worked out what is going on. They've had a lot of different theories, but they've actually got measurements of blood pressure in various parts of the, of the bloodstream. They found that in the neck, they had some, uh, the veins pulled off a bit. So what happens though, the, the giraffe bends down, the blood no longer goes back to the heart and therefore no longer is pushed by the heart and therefore the blood pressure drops very sharply and therefore it doesn't blow its brain out. And when the giraffe raises the neck, uh, the blood pours back into the heart and is pushed up to the neck almost straight away. So no lightheadedness. You know what it's like? Sometimes you, you're lying down and you get up too quickly, you get very lightheaded because the blood hasn't reached your brain yet. Well, the giraffe has an automatic system to prevent that. Now, I'm just telling you this about the giraffe. This is what we know about the giraffe, and it's only been recently discovered. Unfortunately, it's the Brachiosaurus is much taller than a giraffe, so it must have had a blood pressure around 750. So incredibly powerful heart, but what other systems it has? Well, sorry, we only know the bones. We know that God must have uh, programmed them with some quite amazing design features. I wish I knew what they were. I think if a giraffe is pretty amazing design, I think the, the Brachiosaurus would be even more amazing because it's so much bigger. Well, here is a Brachiosaurus again. Well, here's a human. Now you can see an idea of, of how s small we are by comparison, okay? And they have their uh, design features. Now, here's another type of dinosaur. They're all called sauropods if they have the long neck and long tail. Now, this is a different type because its, its hind legs are a bit bigger, so it's a bit of a more horizontal, and all the dinosaurs had their tail fairly horizontal at the hips. Uh, they weren't dragging on the ground. Okay, so go back to the 70s and earlier, right back to the turn of the, of the last century, uh, the dinosaurs were always, were always drawn with the tails dragging the T-Rex with like a kangaroo with a tail coming down. No, that's not possible, it didn't happen. So when you see some carvings of dinosaurs supposedly being drawn by people who saw one, if they show the, the dinosaur tail dragging, that's not kind of been seen. They can't have seen the dinosaur. They must have seen uh, the older reconstructions, not the real reconstructions. Okay, so certain things just don't make sense. But this has a design feature: the arch shape, a very slight arch shape there. See, the arch is an engineering design. See the arch bridge there? The arch provides the strength, and you see how the cables hold up the bridge? That's the arch that provides the, the strength of it. And we have here the arch of the back. It's quite a common feature, and the ribs holding up the large tummy. Okay. Uh, what else do we have about dinosaurs? Well, the uh, question is, what's the biggest one? I mean... I'll show you one candidate called the Amphicelius, supposed to be um, even bigger than a blue whale, 60 meters or 200 feet long. The problem is often with some of these dinosaur types, we haven't got very much of it. Look, here's a picture of some dinosaurs. Now, the black part here is a reconstruction and the white part is what the evidence is. What have they actually found? One part of the backbone, one vertebra is all they've found. They can't tell you what their legs or neck or anything else look like. They haven't got any bones of it. Now contrast that with Diplodocus here. We've got most of the bones. So it's, a fair, it's fair to say what we've got an idea of how big this was. And quite big, a lot bigger than humans. Here's a human in the, in the circle here. But a lot of the other dinosaurs, where's, there's so much of them missing. We got a good idea that Argentinosaurus was pretty big, but we just are not as sure about that as we are of Diplodocus because we just got fewer bones of the things. Now, going back to Amphicelius here, it's even worse because they've only found they only found part of it. It's a broken bone, not a whole bone, a broken bone, and that bone has disappeared. We can't go back and remeasure it to see if they've got it right because it's gone. 
Now, another dinosaur that seems to be very big, uh, known from at least 50% or more of a skeleton, could be this thing called Photolonchosaurus, but even though we know that the feet, the, the hips are 10 feet wide and how, how much they, the belly expands, we haven't got the leg or tail. This might have been about 100 feet long, fully grown, but we're not exactly sure. 50 metric tons, it's quite a, quite a big creature. I think that we can be sure of that, but exactly how much, I'm not sure. So here's a human for scale. Now they had big bellies for a good reason. That's another design feature because uh, a lot of the big plant eaters uh, there and in their intestines are a fermentation chamber. They, they can actually handle very poor quality plant food, twigs and, and dried leaves because they've got this enormous fermentation chamber to digest them. So these dinosaurs could have taken care of very low quality vegetation because they're so big. It means they'd have to eat all, almost the whole time, all their, almost all their waking hours were spent eating, but uh, they could do it. And here's another dinosaur called Dreadnoughtus. Again, this is actually a very complete one, except for a few things of heads missing and some of the necks missing, but they estimated that it might have been bigger than an empty Boeing 737, which is the most common plane I travel on. But actually, even with a lot of bones, there's uncertainty in the weight. They've, some have downgraded to do about a half of what they originally estimated. Now, I mentioned I started off with the Bible because the Bible is God's word. It, it's, it's sufficient to teach us. But then why doesn't the Bible have the word dinosaur? Well, the point is the word dinosaur is a very modern word. See, the King James Bible, it says 1611, Dinosaur was invented 230 years after the King James, and the King James has other English versions before it. Okay, so a lot of uh, the Bible was translated before the word dinosaur was invented, so of course it's not going to have that word. It didn't exist. So here is the inventor of dinosaur. The, the word dinosaur comes from Greek, meaning terrible lizard or terrible reptile. Uh, Sir Richard Owen, now he was the most famous um, paleontologist, which is a fossil hunter, and the anatomist of his day. He was a strong opponent of Darwin. When you look at the history, in fact, uh, a lot of Darwin's opposition came from the scientists. Sad to say, some of his support came from the Church of England, who had already capitulated on millions of years before Darwin came along. Now, to put it into perspective, some of you guys here are probably old enough to remember having to use slide rules and logbooks before calculators. I had to use them in high school. I'm giving my age away a bit, I suppose. The point is the word calculator is a very old word. It's, it goes back to at least to the 14th century, okay, to Oxford, England. Okay, the people called the Merton calculator. You see, calculator is an older word than dinosaur, but you think of calculator as a modern invention. And dinosaur is a very old thing, but in fact, the word calculator is much older than dinosaur. Just to give you perspective of how recent the word dinosaur is, and so of course it takes a while for Bible translators to catch up, but I think they should have caught up by now. Unfortunately, they don't seem to have done. So let's go to the um, oldest book to be completed in the Bible, the book of Job. It's not the, I mean, Genesis covers creation much older than Job, but Genesis goes up to Joseph while Job was around the time of Abraham. Okay, and in Job we have these chapters here, uh, these uh, passages about different animals. We know these animals. Clearly God is trying to tell Job something he knew. He's going to animals that Job was aware of. But then he gets to Job 40 and he still expects Job to know what we're talking about here. And, and what do we see here? Oh, sorry, this one here. Behold behemoth. See, Job was meant to know what behemoth was. And how does he describe it? It's, it? The word behemoth, that's not an English word, you know. It's a Hebrew word. The translators didn't know what it was, so they just left it the Hebrew. 
Now, behemoth in Hebrew is a plural term. Behima is the normal word for beast in Hebrew. So behemoth is the beast of beasts. It's actually a plural. It's, it's, it's a single animal, but it's called by the plural, the beasts, which means the beast of beasts. It's a, it's a, it's a, a plural term of intensity. It's the beast of beasts. It's the biggest creature God had ever made. So that's what the behemoth is. But they didn't know what it was, so they left the word as it is. Now, he's a plant eater. Very powerful, uh, but it says he moveth his tail like a cedar. Now, what is a cedar? Well, this is the, this is the small cedar. Uh, King Solomon used cedars from Lebanon because they were the biggest trees of the area. And when the Bible compared something to a cedar, it meant it was very big and powerful. So when you have this creature that moves his tail like a cedar, well, what do you think of a tail? It's a pretty big, powerful tail. Now, some study Bibles say, well, maybe this was a hippopotamus or an elephant, but okay, let's look at the elephant tail. <clears throat> I don't think it's like a cedar. This is a bonsai cedar, maybe. I don't know. It just doesn't see... Um... Or a hippo. Here's a hippo tail. No, but it doesn't make sense. I, I can't see it's happening somehow. So what about the, this creature here then? Can I glass of water somewhere? Any, any water? Um, so I'm thirsty. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Should have got it before. I'm sorry. But when you look at that sort of creature, remember what I told you here. One thing, when you look at the discover, the discoverers of this creature called Dead Dread Nautus said this had a weaponized tail 30 feet long. You can tell from these chevrons on the bone, these are the, these processes on the, on the tailbone here, that they were there to support very powerful muscles. You can tell that even this, the muscle attached and left a scar on it. So you can tell very powerful muscles supported the tail, 30 feet long, so an incredibly powerful weapon. When you think of the elephant's trunk, it's all muscle, and it's a very strong, powerful weapon, the elephant trunk. But this has got bone as well for the muscles to attach on. So even stronger and longer than an elephant's trunk. So to describe this as a tail like a cedar, that makes perfect sense. It doesn't make sense to describe the elephant or a hippo having a tail like a cedar. So, but if Bible translators are evolutionized and they've, they've been brainwashed into thinking dinosaurs became extinct 66 million years ago, well, of course, Job didn't see one. But under the biblical time tale, well, yeah, he could have. Other people who seem to have seen a dinosaur are these people who carved the temple here in, in Cambodia. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry, talking about the th flood makes you thirsty. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Great. Oh, thank you very much. Now, there's only one creature known with these very distinctive plates on the back. It's a stegosaur. One of the varieties of stegosaur. Now, now, it was discovered in the late 19th century, the stegosaur, and the name means roof lizard because the paleontologists, the American paleontologists who discovered it, thought that the plates were flat on the back, like a roof. Later on, they found he was wrong and the plates were vertical. But the thing is, if someone had just seen a skeleton, they might have, wouldn't have drawn the plates as being vertical. This actually takes quite a lot of advanced knowledge to know the plates were standing upright. But this is exactly what they had 200, um, 800 years ago. The plates in the right position. So either the carver saw one or he had reports, reliable reports of people who had seen one. And then you have words like the... Uh, Dragon in the Bible. The dragon is, is, is a word in the Bible. It's also a word in a lot of different cultures. Uh, like the Chinese calendar, for instance, has a 12-year cycle uh, with lots of real animals. And then we come up with the dragon. And for most of Chinese history, a dragon was just treated as another animal. Nothing special about it. Okay, in, in the last uh, couple of cycles, Chinese parents have actually wanted the kids to be born in the dragon year. That's a very recent development. 
before the, the dragon was just another animal. Which seems to point to the fact that people who drew up this calendar had seen a creature they called the dragon, which we would now call the dinosaur. Now, the modern word for, for, uh, for dragon is long in Chinese, in Mandarin Chinese, okay? Uh, the, the word for dinosaur is konglong, which means terrible dragon. So it's interesting, modern Chinese connects the dinosaurs with their, 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 their classic dragon. And when you look at some of the creatures we have here, uh, some carvings and pictures look like people have seen what we now call dinosaurs. It happens all around the world. You've got this um, medieval, late medieval Briti uh, British tomb here, and it's got some nice bronze et etchings here, but then you get a creature like this with a long neck and, and tail, and they're clearly wrestling with each other there. Um, this is actually an um, amphibian called Areops, which is... Uh, Evolutionists say died out before the dinosaurs arrived. And going back even further, you got these long neck creatures here, which again model what people now think dinosaurs look like. And there's a book here called Dire Dragons. It's a coffee table book which has all these sort of these carvings and, and pictures from all around the world describing creatures we now call dinosaurs. It's quite an interesting book for a conversation starter and everything like that. Uh, for for a sort of high school and middle school, they might like this book called Exploring Dinosaurs with Mr. Hib. Here's a book for younger readers about dinosaurs. So we, we try to have uh, books for all ages. We didn't really have one for high schoolers and adults until... My, I, I and a co-author have written one, which is now in the um, final layout stage, so God willing, it will be published fairly soon. So a very detailed book on dinosaurs we've, we've got coming. Okay, so what happened to them? Well, I think dinosaurs were largely killed by the flood. Here's an example of dinosaur fossils. Remember what I said this morning about to get any sort of fossil at all, you have to bury something quite deeply to protect from scavengers and to stop the, um, the materials falling apart once the soft tissues are, are destroyed, okay? Uh, these are dinosaurs in the middle of a fight. Uh, Protoceratops here, Velociraptor here, the real one, okay? Jurassic Park Velociraptors aren't real, real. They're actually about twice the size of a real one. They're modeled on a creature called Dinonychus, which is about twice as big as a Velociraptor. They call it Velociraptor because it sounds better, supposedly, okay? But this is a real one, okay? Now they're fighting for death here. Yes, look at the claw in the, in the throat here, biting the um, arm there. Now, this is what the evolutionists think was happening when they got fossilized. But see how quickly this must have happened. Otherwise, they would have broken off their fight and fled whatever was trying to bury them, but they, they were just buried right in the middle of what they were doing. So again, the rapid burial of these dinosaurs is what happened here. Another interesting thing, if you go to museums, you might often see these dinosaurs with the neck thrown back. It's very unnatural, but so often we get dinosaurs with their necks thrown back. Very unusual posture. I mean, they wouldn't have been like that in living things. Even uh, the famous Sue the T-Rex basically had its head right by, by its hip bone, even a big thing like that. So, so there's something funny going on that causes dinosaurs to have this posture. Well, the clue, see, uh, when they found they could um, freshly kill chickens, you'd dunk them in water, and sometimes a neck would pop up. The neck would throw back. So what's going on there? Think about this. I've got, I've got a weight here. Pretend this is a head, okay? This is my, uh, a dinosaur head or a um, chicken head thereabouts. Okay, it's quite heavy. It's, it's a skull, okay? See, holding it here is not too hard. But holding it here, that's hard because the leverage is against you, you've got much greater talk here. So if the muscles had to do that job, they'd get exhausted too quickly, okay? So the, it looks like the dinosaurs had a, a, a powerful, a strong elastic ligament going down the spine, which helped to hold up the weight of the head. Didn't do all the work, but did most of the work. So after death, you'd expect the muscles not to work, the head to flop down. Okay, that's what you expect. But if it was in water, especially salty water, around the time of death, then the buoyancy of the water would take the weight of the head, uh, but you still got the elastic ligament pulling on it, and then it would be pulled back. And then buried in that sort of pulled back position. 
Because after death, after sometime after death, the body starts to stiffen, and okay, it might hold that position, okay? But the point is, when so many of these dinosaurs were buried in this head pulled back position, it points to them being underwater around the time of death. And so what would produce a lot of dinosaurs in water when they died? Okay, so another thing, they, they're finding footprints of dinosaurs, that, which is an interesting thing in itself. Because, I mean, if you went outside and left a footprint, how long would your footprint last? Millions of years, maybe? A week? You'd be pushing it for a week, wouldn't you? But this, this was a, goes back to my home state of Queensland and Australia. These were about 3,000 or so dinosaur footprints now, they had to uncover the top layer of rock that was covering them, it lifted up tons of, of, of many tons of the rock, the, it's called the overburden. It covers the layer with the footprints to expose the footprints. Now, the evolutionists said that top layer was millions of years younger than the layer of the footprints. But as soon as they pulled the top layer off, the footprints started to wear away. Even though they were in rock, they started to wear away. And so they built a shed over it to try to protect. That wasn't good enough. So now they're inside a conservation building that, puts, uh, that controls temperature and humidity. It stops running water, running animals, running people. So highly protected footprints. And this is the building we're talking about. So it's really quite, quite spectacular. But the point is, those footprints are fragile, even though the rock is quite hard. But what about when the rock was actually being formed? How could they have lasted millions of years before the next layer um, buried them? So this points to the fact that the dinosaur footprints were laid down and then cemented in place almost right away before they had a chance to erode away. So remember I talked about the flood and the evidence for a flood of being of rapid burial, but also the huge, wide extent of the layers across continents. The third thing is that there's actually hardly any time between the layers. So it's one layer after another with no time between them, almost no time between them. So what we see, it looks like the dinosaurs were trying to escape and they left footprints when they're trying to escape uh, a rising water going in the same direction. Another thing is, uh, all the way we see things that footprints, according to evolutionary dating, footprints are always millions of years older than a dinosaur, than a creature that could have made them. It's not just dinosaurs, there are a lot of different other creatures. You find the footprints here, then millions of years later we find something that could have made them. Now that doesn't make sense, does it? Because the things don't live millions of years. So what makes sense is that you have these creatures making tracks in lower layers, which get buried by the flood in another layer, and eventually the flood catches up with the dinosaur on a higher layer, which is why you have this pattern, footprints first laid down by them trying to escape, and then later the creature itself is buried. So there's a, there can't be much time between when someone leaves a track and when someone's buried. So millions of years is out. Now, another thing that they've found is some soft tissue in, in dinosaur bones. It's been going on for over 30 years, finding uh, studies, uh, for finding blood cells and blood vessels in modern bone, in dinosaur bone, which looks like modern bone. But the thing is, how could things like this survive for millions of years? Not just blood vessels, blood cells, but even individual intact cells, and you have proteins which are dino which are animal proteins and you have dna which again is a very unstable molecule i'll let the lady uh, dr mary schweitzer who discovered most of these she can tell you herself on a 60 minutes program so here we go steak mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral but the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away being a fossil there should have been nothing left but there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. 
This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You say, I didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> that you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like shocked. I mean, how could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones look at that blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. That's an interesting admission, that last one. The, the science says they can't even be a million years old. Yeah, I agree with that. But they still want to hold on to their faith that it's 68 million years old. I'd rather go with the science. That they're not as old as people claim they are. And it's been going on for some time, finding soft tissue and DNA and protein in dinosaur bones, but just shows they haven't been around as long as people claim they have been. So hopefully this will show you not only the, that the dinosaurs were buried underwater, uh, but it wasn't, didn't happen very long ago either. So how could people like Job and other people have seen dinosaurs if they were buried in the flood? Well, the Bible tells you that not everything died in the flood. Um, some things were preserved. No, I hate this picture. Please, I don't want to see that picture anymore. It's horrible. Um, see, a picture like that tells the kids the Ark of Fairy story. Please don't show it to them. Kids are quite visual, and they, they go to public school, the government school, and they say, well, here the, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and ancient Native Americans and Norsemen, they all had their myths, and maybe the Bible is just a Hebrew myth. Well, no, it's not. The Bible's a book of history. The Bible tells you how big the ark was. It doesn't look like this with a giraffe neck poking out the chimney or animals happy and smiling as the world was being destroyed. I mean... Now, here's the instructions. We're supposed to make the ark 300 cubits long. Here's a cubit, by the way. This is a cubit, 300, uh, uh, elbow to fingertip. Cubit comes from Latin word for elbow, to elbow to your middle fingertip. Now, if you have a blood draw from here, yeah, that's where you have it, isn't it? That's called the cubital fossa, just for a bit of information for you. So here's a cubit, 300 cubits long. Uh, 50 uh, wide and 30 high. That, and it had three decks as well. So how big is that? Well, it's, a, it's longer than a football field. And it's wider than six lanes of the interstate. And it's taller than a four-story building. So here are humans for scale. You see how tiny humans are compared to this massive boat. See, I mean, there are ways of telling kids this at an age-appropriate level, that it really was a huge vessel. Now, today, often the biggest things we, vessels we see on land and, uh, are the semi-trailers, which block up the, uh, the interstate and all lanes usually okay. You can't see past them for the signs. But the ark was big enough to hold the amount of 340 semi-trailers. I calculated it, okay? So that's how big it was, which is six wide and half a mile long. That's a lot of semi-trailers uh, needed to load up the arcs. The arc's a huge vessel. Uh, here, here you can see again, I mean, how tiny the semi-trailer looks compared to the arc, and look how people, you can, I can barely see them. And it's also a very stable boat. Because it's uh, so wide, it's almost impossible to capsize. In fact, it would... Uh, withstand uh, waves over 100 feet high, which is about three times bigger than a tsunami. And tsunamis, we know, are very, are very destructive uh, waves that uh, happen after earthquakes, but the, the ark could have withstood one of those. That's how stable it was. So God knew what he was doing when he made the dimensions of the ark. He made it so it was very stable. Now, 
God built the ark specifically so Noah could have his uh, son, his, his wife and his, and his three sons and their wives. So when you do the calculation, that's about 70 years from God telling him to build the ark to when he needed the ark. So 70 years to build the ark. It's a long time to build, maybe hide people. I mean, money wasn't going to buy much after the flood, so he could afford to spend money on workmen. And hopefully they, were, they would come on, but they didn't, never, never did. But he, that's the idea. Uh, so two of every kind, um, at least two. Seven, there are a few animals which are clean, so seven pairs of each of the clean. But most animals were just one pair each. And some creatures didn't have to go on the ark because you don't have to rescue sea creatures from a flood. So no whales on the ark. No fish had to be on the ark. And uh, also, uh, only animals that had nostrils uh, were, were on the ark. That's what the Bible tells you. So insects, uh, invertebrates didn't have to be on the ark as passengers because they could survive on rafts of vegetation pulled apart and matted together, which would float for some time. In fact, Darwin himself showed that um, uh, creatures could be on, on floating dead uh, uh, driftwood for, for months at a time. So it's, it's Darwin himself, you know, anti-God Darwin, showed that things could have survived a flood. The small things could have survived the flood. He also showed that seeds could still germinate even if they'd been submerged in, in brine for months. And that's what, again, how, how, how plants and insects didn't have to be passengers on the ark. Only animals with backbones, vertebrates. So no, no congressmen, okay? <laughs> but see, dinosaurs started off quite small. That's one thing to think about. So even the biggest ones weren't, did, started off small. But let's look at something else which is interesting because these are the same kind of creature. Remember what I said at the beginning that uh, God made things to reproduce after their kind? But the kind is much broader than the, the genus or the species because these creatures are all the same kind because they can have babies together. They're called hybrids when they've got different kinds having babies, like male lion and female tiger is called a liger. If it's the other way around, it's called a tigon, which shows that they're the same kind. And also, you can trace it, you can uh, link the, these things to a leopard, but leopard can actually interbreed with a smaller cat, and that can interbreed with something a bit smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the pussycat. So, in fact, you can trace a line from the tiger right down to the pussycat to show they're all the same created kind. Now, a tiger and a pussycat can't do it together, but there are things in between that can. So, basically, one cat kind is all Noah needed. Here's some more of these sort of creatures. A liger, it's the biggest cat in the world today. A karma, your camel and llama. Beefalo, guess what that is? Buffalo and basic beef producing thing. Okay, what's this one here? Zonkey. Zors. Geep. Uh, what's that one called? I don't know. Pig and boar. Poor. I don't know. Yeah. Pisley. Polar bear and grizzly, okay. I think there are growler bears too. Uh, wolfen, let's say a false killer whale and a bottlenose dolphin. And the wolfen had babies of her own. Which means uh, that, again, these creatures, the, the wolf and the whale and the dolphin were the same kind. They could have babies together. So that, that reduces the number of kinds that Noah had to have on board. I mean, if you look at things like doggies today... How many are, are in this picture here? This is a great day in Chihuahua. These are all the same kind. They're both dogs, and so are wolves and jackals. Now, Chihuahua and Great Dane can have babies together, but they need artificial ways to do it, though. But some of these creatures can, can have wolves can interbreed, and so can jackals. So again, one dog kind covers wolves and jackals. And dinosaurs, well, these creatures here... Maybe one kind here. I mean, even evolutionists have said that you've got one kind of creature with different head ornaments. Or maybe about 50 dinosaur kinds in all. It's not very many, really. Lots of names, but just about 50 or so kinds. I mean, for instance, the, these are the big ones. Pardon me, the sauropods, the animals with a long neck and tail. 
See, look, at the, these are, are classified very differently, but when you look at the skulls alone, they seem to be the same kind of creature. But see, the Diplodocus was just a very long, skinny version of a Patasaurus. So about a third of the weight, but a bit, quite a bit longer. So long and very slender. And the other thing that's been discovered fairly recently is that dinosaurs changed shape when they grew. And this is Jack Horner. This is the Jack who was on that video before. It's Jack Horner. And he discovered that uh, these three creatures have different names, but they're really the same creature at different stages. The baby, uh, Dracorex, the teenager, if, if you like, uh, the Stegomolok, and the fully grown one was the Pachycephalosaurus, but one creature at different stages. So Noah takes one pair for these three, not three pairs. And he said that about a third of dinosaur species may never have existed, but at the stages of the growth of other known dinosaurs. And even things like the Triceratops, when it became older, it had a hole in the skull, in the, in the frill there, and became a Taurosaurus. So again, this cuts down on the number of kinds. But another discovery which cuts down on the amount of space is the fact that we've got lots of small dinosaurs, even fully grown, like the Sutusaurus was very small, Troodon was uh, smaller than we are. And you got this Frutadens, which is a, the smallest known plant eater. And even big ones started off as eggs no bigger than footballs. And uh, they found studies on dinosaur bones found they had growth rings. And from the growth rings, they can tell how fast the dinosaur grew. And every dinosaur analyzed uh, went through the same sort of growth pattern, slow at first, then a sudden spurt, and then leveled off. So did Noah have to take the 25-ton, 30-ton Apatosaurus or take one who's four years old and one ton? And a year later, it gets off the ark and then starts its growth spurt. Yeah, five and a half tons per year. So it didn't take long to get to the full height, but didn't mean that Noah had to take them on while they were growing. So every dinosaur had that pattern. So I think God was the one who sent the animals to Noah. Noah didn't have to fetch them. And I think God would have picked ones that were a year before they were to start their growth spurt. And how do you feed them all? Well, in fact, you've got lots of different uh, uh, low-tech solutions available. I mean, you've got the Hrup style where you've got the, the, the gutter drain system here. A central filling station for water and for grain. So again, low, lay, low, low, low maintenance sort of thing, because so, it sort of automatically drains stuff away. You've got flood, you've got rainwater, plenty of that around, I think, in the flood. And you have uh, other examples, a pot style, where you uh, have straw that keeps on going up as the animals are contaminated. The, the straw uh, it actually uh, helps to clean the stuff. It actually prevents it getting too stinky. So it's a very hygienic way of keeping animals through the winter, just bury them and have lots of deep straw there. And in fact, the only time it really is, is really pongy is when it's washed out after the winter. But while it's in use, it's actually quite hygienic. So again, you've got very low tech ways of keeping lots of animals through the winter that required not too much maintenance. Now, when it comes to dinosaurs, what happened to them? I think humans hunted them. That's why you have dragon legends around the world and eventually the humans won and killed the last dragon, okay? So I think that's part of what happened. The ice age after the flood may have been a problem. Uh, but evolutionists don't really know. There's been a mystery for evolutionists. One is called the junkie theory where you have uh, narcotic plants evolving. And the plant eaters got stoned and the meat eaters had nothing left to hunt. And you have the constipation theory, a low roughage plants evolved, no food value, okay. Uh, asteroid impact, one of the, the, the uh, common ones these days, but it has its problems of its own. I mean, you've got skeptics in the evolutionary community. Like for instance, dinosaurs, dinosaurs were meant to have ruled the earth for 180 million years. That's the evolutionary dating. And yet they were wiped out by this, this uh, meteor, but the crocodiles survived, supposedly, and as did moths and frogs, okay, which are quite delicate creatures. They survived the impact, but the dinosaurs didn't. So it seems like the meteorite would have wiped out the wrong things. And my own favorite evolutionary view is the Gary Larson one, 
uh, where the tobacco evolved, they all died of lung cancer. <laughs> so the evolution haven't, haven't really got a good idea of it. They've got lots of different theories, but none of them really make too much sense when you look at them in more detail. Uh, so let's conclude here. What, what we can summarize about dinosaurs, they tell us about God's creativity because you've got some amazing design features, a lot of variety, uh, di design features we can tell from the bones, some creature with a thing which we must know they had, but we just don't know exactly what they were. They tell us about the fall I mentioned earlier in the morning because we've, they're dead, therefore they happened, they, they, they were the result of the fall. That's when death uh, entered and God judged because of the fall and a very severe judgment was the flood which started all over again and wiped out everything not on the ark which includes most of the dinosaurs but also it tells about God's mercy and providence because God gave people a way out there's actually so much room on the ark it was far more room than Noah and his three his wife and three sons their wives and the animals needed they had far more room if anyone had, had repented God Noah was preaching righteousness the whole 70 years if people had listened they could have gone on with the, the ark but even his own brothers and sisters didn't seem to listen so but in one sense they even tell us about the gospel because the ark was the only way to escape that physical judgment in Noah's day there's only one way to escape the judgment to come and that is through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior Amen. so this concludes the uh, dinosaur talk now I'm going to open it up to Q&A if you want